Dear viewers, greetings to all of you and welcome to this weekly strategic insight session presented by Tilotama Foundation. Tilotama Foundation is engaged in international relations, financial, environmental, strategic and defense policy globally. I'm Yukta Acharya, Senior Coordinator and Research Associate to Tilotama Foundation. This week, our topic is towards a strategic culture in India's foreign policy. And we have Professor Onik Chatterjee, noted author and analyst with us. Professor Chatterjee has been a close associate of Tilotama Foundation, having been a part of several of our conferences in 2019. Professor Chatterjee has been a full, Fulbright Nehru visiting professor at the University of Virginia and an ICCR visiting professor. Indian foreign policy has undergone a lot of transformations and adjustments over the years with changing geopolitical circumstances and alternations of the world order. In this regard, we may look at the foreign policy decisions of the Prime Minister P.V. Narshima Rao's government, which found itself in a tough and unique situation with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Our engagement with the Central Asian states like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, to name a few, began from them. Our foreign policy needed reorientation according to the requirements of the unipolar world. The policy of economic liberalization also helped in this regard. We must also acknowledge the contributions of the governments under Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and of course, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee in making India a nuclear power. Atal Bihari, Atal Bihari Vajpayee in making, has changed Sorry, our nuclear, our nuclear capability has changed the way other states perceive us. South Asia is an extremely sensitive location today with three nuclear powers in close proximity. India and all other powers in the region therefore play a very cautious game. We have fought several wars with Pakistan, but it's more than 20 years since our last war with Pakistan, the Kargil War in 1999. In recent past, we have gone for surgical strikes and airstrikes as responses to acts of violence by Pakistan-sponsored militants. With India, the border disputes have heated up in very recent times, but both sides are striving to reduce the tensions and prevent escalation. Our naval and air force capabilities have been boosted significantly in recent years, but much more needs to be done. India has some leverage in the Indian Ocean over China. India's joint military activity with the other quad powers can pose a significant challenge to Chinese assertiveness in this front. India has a Kiev class aircraft carrier, INS Vikramaditya. India also has Kamotra class, Kukri class, Pora class, Veer class, and Abhay class corvettes, Kolkata class. Class, Delhi class, and Rajput destroyer, Shivali class, Sarwar class, Brahmaputra class, and Godavari class frigates, and also Aryan class nuclear submarines. India also has conventionally powered submarines and patrol vessels, offshore patrol vessels of Saryu class and Sukanya class, tugboats, amphibious warfare ships of Shardul class, Kumbhir class, and Magar class, among others. Tor torpedo recovery vessels of Ashtradhani class and patrol boats. The Indian Coast Guard, Guard uses the helicopters Boeing P-8 Poseidon Dornier DO-228 for patrol and the indigenously manufactured Hull Ruva and French manufactured Hull Cheta for multi-purpose utility. The Navy also uses MiG-29 for combat purposes. However, often raise the issue of Chinese superiority in nuclear submarines and other naval technology. But these problems are not ins insurmountable and can be overcome with land action. If I talk about the Indian Air Force capabilities, India has MiG-21, the Sol Mirage 2000, Shukhoi 30, India manufactured Hal Tejas and the newly acquired the Sol Rafale as some of the major combat aircrafts. Under airborne early warning and control or EWNC segment, India has EMB-145 and Bereave A-50. The Indian Air Force also has several advanced aircrafts for strategic airlift, tactical airlift, surveillance, and electronic warfare purposes. 
Indian Air Force also has multiple combat transport, multi-utility and licensed purpose helicopters, including Hull Cheetah, Hull Rudra, MI-24, MI-17, Boeing AH-64, among others. I have already mentioned about Hull Rudra and Hull Cheetah earlier. The Defense Research and Development Organization, the DRDO, has been doing a great job when it comes to upgrading and enhancing the abilities of India's military equipment. However, much progress needs to be made. India needs to have its neighbors like Sri Lanka, Maldives on its side for better success in the Indian Ocean region. Same goes for neighbors like Bangladesh. There needs to be confidence building measures. I feel that India is doing a lot when it comes to public diplomacy. The Prime Minister's efforts along with the Ministry of External Affairs and our overseas missions are bearing good results. We need to have our allies strongly by our side. We need to support them and stand by them. India has a huge soft power potential. We need to use it effectively. India needs to strengthen and consolidate its presence in its neighborhood and extended neighborhood as the foundational step towards a much larger global role. We need to deal strongly and effectively with threats in our neighborhood. We need to fully utilize regional multilateral forums like the SARC, BIMSTEC, SCO, ASEAN Plus, etc. India definitely needs to think strategically today. There has to be a game plan. For instance, we need to have a proper proper plan about Afghanistan and how we want to proceed with our Central Asian partners, or our game plan for the Southeast South China Sea dispute. India can achieve all its goals through effective strategizing and proper execution. Let us now listen to Professor Chatterjee. Please begin your talk. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chadia, and uh, thank you, Tilakama Foundation for inviting me to talk on an issue which is not much discussed in Indian foreign policy or in overall Indian, Indian strategic uh, thoughts. Today, I'll talk about what's strategic culture in Indian foreign policy. Now, this is not, uh, as I said, it's not uh, a much popular area uh, in the overall discourse of Indian policy. Because when we discuss Indian foreign policy, we are prone to discuss, you know, uh, bilateral relations, that is relations between two nations, or multilateral relations. But we are uh, seldom we discuss uh, these areas, like strategic uh, culture. Now, what do we actually mean by strategic culture? What it is? I should uh, verify at the very beginning because uh, you know for the those who those who are not aware about strategic culture, uh, I should tell them that it is the nation's attitudes, values, symbols, traditions, practices, and ways of adapting to the environment for solving problems with respect to the threat or use of force. Now, in very simple words, strategic culture refers to a nation's attitude towards threat or use of force. A nation's attitude towards threat or use of force. Such an attitude should not be bereft of a nation's traditions and cultural aspects. So, therefore, <clears throat> strategic culture is a nation's attitudes towards the use or threat of use of force. Now, it has three aspects. Strategic culture has three aspects. First, security outside national borders or external security. Second, security of the national borders, that is our boundary security. And third, security within the country, that is internal security. So Indian beliefs, attitudes, and ways of dealing with these security issues refer to a strategic culture in India. Now, foreign policy is more concerned with 
with the first two type of uh, security. Although the third, that is internal security, is important for achieving goals of national independence. So, strategy culture therefore refers to warfare and also security issues during peace. Now, let us see whether warfare strategies were there in India or whether they are currently there in India. Because it is an area of warfare which we Indians do not really like to talk about. We, we do talk about peace, we do talk about nonviolence, we are peace loving, everybody wants to be peace loving. So therefore, this, this warfare strategy, this warfare thinking, it has been a bit neglected, I would say, in, in Indian <clears throat> culture. Now, do we really have a warfare strategy? If yes, what it is? If not, whether we would require it? And why do we require it? Do we have any grand strategy regarding what? Uh, now, we, we will look to answers to these questions uh, in, in the course of our presentation. Now, if we look at from ancient India to, say, post-colonial India, if we look at this long history, we will find a very rich heritage in ancient India regarding you know, strategic thoughts and implement of strategic thoughts and ideas. Now I would, I would uh, talk about Ortho uh, the famous treatise of Kautil. <clears throat> now in Ortho uh, in ancient India, and even in the two epics like the Ramayana and Mahabharata, we do find references to strategic thoughts. In Ortho Shastra, it is an important document. The Ortho Shastra is an important document of diplomacy and what, what and uh, it has talked about open war, overt war, and silent. Very interesting. Uh, in those times, nearly 2500 BC, before Christian era, uh, they talked about open war, covert war, and silent. Now, for a long time, this Orthoshastra was referred to by emperors, kings, and we know about our, the epics, uh, Mahabharata and Ramayana. There, if you, you think about, say, Krishna's advice to Arjun in Mahabharata uh, regarding wars, uh, regarding how wars should be fought, uh, because Arjun was in confusion whether he should wage a war against villages. But Krishna said, in, in a war, nobody is your village, nobody is your friend. To think about your motherland, to think about protecting your, your land, your kingdom. So, in these ancient documents, I talked about Arthur Shastra, I talked about Mahabharata, and uh, if you know that <clears throat> Arjun's uh, advices, uh, they, Sarman, they also make uh, the Gita. So, in these documents, we find uh, very strong strategic thoughts. Thoughts about war, thoughts about peace. And for a long time, since ancient India, to say medieval period, uh, these uh, you know, thoughts were <clears throat> followed, these were referred to by the emperors, by the kingdom, the kings. And these were the guiding principles for a very long time. But according to historian Basha, A.L. Basha, 
who wrote a very wonderful book, The Wonder That Was India. And in that book, Basham lamented that in, in the medieval period, the medieval India, we did not really have any strategic thought. By that time, by that time, the influences of Arthashastra or the ancient cities have uh, minimized, have been done, or, or due to due to period, due to a long time gap, uh, the new rulers they have forgotten about those, uh, you know, documents like Arthashastra or the Mahabharata. And in medieval India, according to historian Ed Basha, we did not really have any strategic culture or and that is why, according to Basha, uh, there, there were no alliances. Although there were many big kingdoms, valiant kings, individual heroes, but no warfare. There were individual heroes, there were uh, large armies, there were you know, kingdoms, not empires. In media of India, and therefore, but there was no warfare strategy. As a result, medieval India really could not get or could not thwart the foreign aggressions like the Tars. They invaded India, and the Indians they they were helpless. They, they the kings they could not do anything. So and they were reluctant to forge alliances, uh, particularly with foreign rulers. Now, in ancient India, we find such alliances. In Chandragupta's time, uh, there, there were uh, great alliances with, say, uh, the Greeks. Megasthenes reported about it. But in medieval India, such alliances or strategies of what they were absent. <clears throat> now, uh, for a long time, therefore, India was invaded by different foreign invaders. India was attacked by different foreign invaders. And as a result, in medieval India, we really did not find any strong strategic culture like we got in ancient India. Now, Thereafter, we we were colonized by the British. <clears throat> now, I am not taking into account the colonial period because during the long colonial rule that the British two hundred years of colonial rule, we were actually we were not sovereign, and therefore India was not free to decide its own course. India was not free to devise its own strategies. So, in the what, whatever the British did for India, Indians had to accept it. So we did not really have our independence. We did not really have our sovereignty to formulate our own policies. So, after. The colonial rule, what we what we normally call the post-colonial era, or after independence, what is the scenario? What was the scenario after independence? Now, Jawaharlal Nehru, he was the first prime minister of India, as we know after independence. Now, Nehru was, I would say, he masterminded India's foreign policy. He loved this area. He was really a foreign policy person. And he actually invented non-aligned policy, which was staying away from the influence of the two superpowers at a time when the Cold War started. Nehru wanted to follow an independent autonomous force for Indian foreign policy. And Nehru followed the non-aligned force. So Nehru was to some extent a pioneer of Indian foreign policy, but minus strategy. Nehru did not or could not develop any strategic 
cult. Why? Nehru believed that political solutions were enough for security problems. Nehru always believed that you need political solutions for military problems. And he wanted to see himself as a great alliance leader. He talked about demilitarization. He talked about, uh, as I said, political solutions to military problems. But the world was getting militarized. The world was really overtly or overtly, the world was getting militarized. Therefore, when the Chinese attacked us in 1962, we had no answer because we had no answer. And there are accounts by several top army personnel. The, the sorry plight of Indian soldiers during the 90s. There was no planning, there was no strategy as such, because we did not believe in wars, we believed in peace. But the world was getting different. The world was not following peace on the world was getting militarized. Apart from the two superpowers, China, then the two superpowers were Soviet Union and United States. China was not a superpower at that time, but China was also getting militarized covert. And they proved to be superior to us in the 1962 war, in which we got defeated. So we did not develop any security cult during Nehru time. Then after Nehru, we got one efficient lady as Prime Minister, although, although in between there was Dal Bahadur Shastri. After Nehru, we had Dal Bahadur Shastri as our Prime Minister uh, for, a, for a small period. And Shastri actually develop some kind of military preparation. Then we got Mrs. Indira Gandhi as our prime minister. And Indira realized that India was in a style never. India already had fought three wars when Indira Gandhi came to office. India fought against Pakistan in the 1947-48 war. India fought against China in the 62 war. India fought against Pakistan again in, a, in the 1965 war. So when Indira Gandhi assumed office of the Prime Minister of India, our country had gone to war twice. And the results of those were uh, those wars were not very promising. Therefore, Indira realized that India should be strong. And he uh, and uh, Indira Gandhi, she actually deviated from the policies of her father, although, although unofficial. Officially, India followed the policies of Jarlal Nehru. But unofficially, India deviated from Why, how, why, sir? How do you say this? Because Indira, for the first time, went for nuclear tests in 1974, which is known as, now known as Pokhara One. In the 1974 test, India went nuclear for the first time. This and that was Indira Gandhi's time. And before that, the preparation started earlier. The preparation started, as I said, much earlier. But this whole decision was taken by Mrs. Gandhi to actually test it. So therefore, therefore uh, 
in the 1971 war, three years before the India case, in the 1971 war with Pakistan, India got a decisive victory, very quick victory. India inflicted a quick defeat on Pakistan, and India established itself as a regional power, as a regional power in South Asia. So that was Indira Gandhi's. The triumph of Indira Gandhi's foreign policy. But even at that time, there was no strategic thought, there was no strategic culture, no strategic culture ever. Now, I'm jumping a bit. Then we move on to Narsimara, who was a pioneer of Indian economic reforms in 1991. Narsimara and his finance minister, Mohan Singh. They initiated reforms, economic reforms. India, when uh, India became a liberal market economy gradually, and that attracted attention of the world, especially the industrialized world towards India. But even during that time, I mean, during Narsimha Rao's period, there was no strategy. As such, there was a massive jump, there was a massive transformation in Indian economy from a, from a closed socialist type of economy, from a closed state controlled economy. India became an open liberal market economy, and the world was adopted towards India gradually. But as far as strategic culture was concerned, this strategic culture, that is, warfare strategies or, or strategies during peace time, warfare strategies during peace time, that really also did not develop during the Now, in 1998, we had a second series of nuclear tests under, under the premiership of Patel Bihari Bajan. Patel Bihari Bajpayee in, in May 1998 tested five nuclear devices for India, which came to be known as Oka 2. And Bajpayee uh, was, the Bajpayee government was bold enough to declare that these states were necessary for India's security. Now, what was the difference? In 1974, during Pokhran 1, we said that, you know, our tests were for peaceful purposes. Buddha smile, that was the code language. Buddha smile. So, our tests were for peaceful purposes. That was our official declaration in 1974. And the world really did not take it. You were going nuclear, you were testing nuclear devices, and you were saying this for peaceful purposes. Uh, the world really did not accept it. The difference in 1998 was India boldly said, very boldly. But yes, we do have two nuclear neighbors, China on the northern side, Pakistan on the western side. So we have two nuclear neighbors. As a result, India's security is threatened. So for security purposes, we need nuclear weapons. But we will not use it for the first time. It's a no first use policy. If we are attacked, then only we will kill. So, a more tougher stand, I would say, that slowly quitted Indian policy, slowly arrived in Indian policy. That is, now we are bold enough to say, well, 
it is for our security we must go for it although it is for deterrence we still believe that nuclear weapons are for deterrence purposes and the no first use policy and gradually a nuclear doctrine happened. for the first time since independence i wrote about it in many journals many of my writings that for the first time since independence we got a nuclear doctrine how and why we could use our nuclear device how to use nuclear weapon and as i said the no first use policy was there that india will not use it first if india is threatened if india is under attack then india will use it. and now thereafter subsequently the no first use policy was also uh, under consideration and now the stand more or less is that if necessary we will not hesitate to use it. now the stand is like this if necessary we will not hesitate to use it. although although again if we are threatened if we are attacked then only we will consider about nuclear option exercising our nuclear option so i would say from the late 1990 i was talking about 1998 from the late 90 specifically from 1998 onwards we really thought of a strategy and a war strategy now strategic culture is something as i say which refers to your culture which refers to your beliefs your your environment everything now india has always been a peaceful country our foreign policy has actually developed on this idea the idea of peace we had we had ashoka we had several the gurus from different who talked about peace buddha abhi every talked about peace then mahatma gandhi so we we were a starving nation we are a starving we also need static culture during peace time now think of what happened in the galwan in the ladakh region this that was absolutely a peace time but the lsc was violated the line of actual conflict was violated by chinese troops and uh, they attacked us. now how to defend our borders i talk about the three elements of security strategy five the three elements the second element was defending our borders we have huge borders in several neighboring states running up to 5000 kilometers in different areas in the north the northeast in the eastern side in the west everywhere we have borders with neighbors even in the south sea border with Sri Lanka, so, so we are surrounded by neighbors. Some of the neighbors are nuclear powers, and therefore we have to defend our borders. Now, what would be our strategy? Say, in case of covert or silent, like if our in the border region if our soldiers are attacked what would we do what would be our strategy now countries like usa or china they have developed a grand strategy and several you know different strategies 
for different areas, for different situations. But in India, we lack this kind of grand strategy or several smaller strategies to deal with different situations. In India, we do lack this strategy culture. Now, India wants to be a major. There is no denial of the fact. There is no confusion about that India wants to be a major power. Now, if you want to be a major power, your foreign policy establishments must be very strong. India has a strong military. Indian economy is somehow is developing. It is, uh, as, as per the reports of several foreign agencies, it is going, going at a rapid pace. Indian economy is so, therefore, Indian economy is growing, Indian military is strong. But what about Indian foreign policy establishments? Indian foreign policy establishments, you need to have more personnel in Indian foreign policy establishments. I mean, more IFS officers, you need, because we have to man nearly 200 diplomatic missions all over the world. As per one document of the Ministry of External Affairs, MEA, Government of India. MEA, Government of India, it is one document and it says that we have around 800 personnel, like an officer level, an officer level. We have 800 officers in the Indian Foreign Ministry. That is, in the IFS, we have 800 personnel. We have to ban 190 diplomatic missions all over the world. And at the same time, you have to ban the Ministry of External Affairs in your own country. So it's 800 now. It is not at all enough. It has to be at least 5,000 people, at least. So a country which is seen as a growing power, as an emerging power by the world, must have a very strong foreign policy established in terms of personnel, in terms of infrastructure. We must have important desks, separate desks for different countries, at least for important countries. So that is also part of your strategic culture. A strong foreign policy is coming. A very strong infrastructural facilities in terms of personnel, in terms of you know, physical infrastructure. So we have to develop that. Apart from brand strategies or apart from several other strategies, we have to develop strong foreign policy establishments. We have to develop a strong foreign policy establishment in terms of personnel, in terms of physical interest. Apart from a strong military that India possesses. And I would also say that India must have a very strong navy, the presence of a very strong navy in the Indian Ocean region. That is also necessary. So we, in the near future, we must have world-class Navy, topmost Navy in the world, and topmost Air Force in the world, apart from the land force that is the military. So we must look forward to that direction. And we must be ready to provide answers to covert wars, to Overt wars, because overt large scale wars will, may not happen in the future. Large scale wars may not happen in the future because of you know, economic necessity, because of financial necessity. But overt wars will continue, like border clash. These will continue, overt wars will continue. So, therefore, we must be ready. We must be prepared to provide answers 
to our adversaries, to our enemies. And we must have strong strategic thoughts what to do in times of crisis. We, in India, we must develop that strategy. So with that, I finish. I, uh, I think I have uh, talked for nearly 45 minutes. So with that, I finish. Thank you to the Pama Foundation again for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Professor Chatterjee, for your precise and lucid talk. You explored the existence of any strategic culture in foreign policy since ancient times. You specifically talked about the policies of uh, Prime Ministers Jawaharlal Nehru, Indira Gandhi, P.V. Narasimha Rao, and Atal Bihari Vajpayee. There is definitely a need for a strategic culture in India. You talked about uh, the development of India's nuclear doctrine during the Vajpayee era, but in recent past, uh, there has been hints of it being reformed. You have touched upon that also in your talk. Military capability enhancement is very important also. So I thank you once again.